Sharks have been known to inspire both awe and dread. The sheer power and veracity of certain species can give rise to nightmarish scenarios. In exceedingly rare instances, a shark, driven by instinctual hunger and a formidable set of jaws, might engage in a predatorial strike so swift and efficient that it can swallow someone's entire body. Hit that like button and subscribe right now. In today's episode, we go over three times a shark has swallowed someone whole. Welcome to Final Affliction. Swimming in the ocean has been popular throughout history for its proven physical, mental, and spiritual benefits. Seawater helps to relax your muscles, improves your mood, and cleanses your aura leading to an all-around better quality of life. Although the pastime is popular across the generations, the older a person gets, then the more benefits they will receive from swimming in the sea. As a result, lots of elderly people will swim every day to improve their flexibility, especially if they live near the ocean. In most places of the world, there would be little risk associated with the hobby, aside from the occasional friendly fish encounter. But as most people know, the Australian waters are home to some of the world's most venomous fish, as well as the most dangerous sharks. Even if you know the area well, and you've visited the same beach thousands of times before, you never know when your luck will run out in Australian waters. 63-year-old Christine Armstrong was in a good mood, not that she was ever in a particularly bad mood. She had just returned home after her holiday in New Zealand, where she had been able to explore the country and relax. Although she had a good time, she always loved her day-to-day -day life and was happy to return and get back into her normal routine. Among other things, her favorite part of her day was her daily swim in the sea in Tathra. She lived very close to the ocean, something that she had carefully planned with her husband when they moved there, as she was an avid swimmer and ocean enthusiast. She had been coming to the same spot every morning for the last 14 years, so she knew the area better than most. She preferred to swim alone, but was always happy when people wanted to come with her, especially her husband, Rob Armstrong. Rob had lived in Tathra for 60 years and had watched as the area had gradually become overrun with sharks. Although they used to be hunted by local fishermen, this practice had been banned in the 90s, leading to a population increase. He had always worried about his wife swimming there, but she had never reported seeing any sharks while she was out, so he thought that maybe he was overreacting. He would soon come to realize just how right he was, in the worst way possible. On April 3, 2014, Christine and her husband went to their usual swimming area with a couple of friends, ready to swim the 250-meter circuit that they regularly swam. Chatting as they approached the beach, Christine was telling them all about her trip to New Zealand while they listened intently to her every word. She was happy to have such close friends, and as they began to swim out, she felt at peace now that she was back home again. After they got a little way out to sea, Christine changed her mind about the morning swim. Her body was aching from the flight the day before, so she decided to head back to shore instead, leaving her husband and her friends to complete the circuit alone. Telling everyone that she would meet them back on shore, she began to head back. They had already made it quite far out from shore, but she was confident that she would make it back without a problem. As she swam, she admired her surroundings and watched as her friends disappeared from sight. She was sad about not being able to complete her daily swim, but was sure that her body would feel better tomorrow. What she didn't know is that she was being stalked by a huge shark beneath her, which was watching her movements and readying itself for the attack. It had been attracted to the area by the smell of a rotting shark corpse nearby, but was more than happy to hunt for easy prey. Unfortunately, today would not be Christine's lucky day, and before she even knew what had happened to her, she was silently pulled beneath the waves by the massive shark as the animal swallowed her whole. The rest of the group had no idea what had happened and were still completing their circuits, thinking that Christine would be waiting for them on the shore when they got back. Once they were finished, they started racing back to shore, but Rob had a bad feeling 
As they rounded the bay, scanning the water, he suddenly spotted a large dark mound in the water and immediately identified it as a large bronze whaler shark. With birds circling, he knew that the shark had caught something and they would have to be careful not to attract its attention. He saw his friends heading straight for it as they clearly hadn't spotted it yet. He began shouting out to them to stop and turn around. He caught up to them before they swam straight into it and decided that the best way to avoid an attack would be to form a barrier together. They knew that if the shark were to attack, it would go for a singular victim. If they stuck together in a chain, the shark was less likely to attack. Luckily, this worked and they were able to escape unharmed. As they laughed with each other about what a close call that was, Rob realized that someone was missing, his wife. He was expecting her to greet them on the shore, but she was nowhere to be seen. He began to panic and started to ask people on the beach if they had seen her leave the water, to which they replied no. No one had come out of the water except them. They started to search the areas that she could have gone, as maybe the beachgoers had missed her when she left the sea. They checked the changing rooms and the car, but she wasn't there, so they decided to head back into the water to see if they could see her. They hoped that she had maybe continued swimming by herself in a different part of the ocean and just hadn't come in yet, or had left the water on a different beach. But as time passed, they began to realize that this was more and more unlikely. Afraid to swim into the water, after seeing the large whaler shark, they took a boat out and started their search. While calling out her name as they went along, they suddenly found clear evidence that they would never see Christine again. Human remains. There was not much left, but by the amount of blood that was staining the water, they knew that she must have died. Realizing the worst had happened, Rob called for the emergency services, stating that there had been a shark attack. They arrived quickly and began to scan the waters, where, among the blood and carnage, they were able to retrieve the swim cap and goggles belonging to Christine. Rob was devastated. It was never determined what species of shark was responsible for Christine's death. Although there was the large whaler shark seen by the swimmers, it was thought that a great white shark would be more likely due to the expected size of the animal. It was suspected that Christine was killed instantly swallowed whole by the animal, something a whaler shark would have had a hard time doing. The authorities stated that they wouldn't search for the shark responsible and instead focused on educating people about the dangers of the beach. More and more illegal fishermen had been visiting the area in the last few years and would place bait to attract the animals. They began to increase their watch in the bay to ensure that this practice would stop in order to save more lives in the future. Although horrified by the death of his wife, Rob was relatively optimistic about the last moments of her life, stating that she must have been nearly instantly killed as the shark that he had spotted had been so large. He and others in the group that day estimate the shark they saw to be around six meters long, making it double the size of even the largest bronze whaler shark. With very little remaining of Christine, it was assumed that the animal must have swallowed her almost entirely, leaving nothing for her family to find besides her goggles and cap. Although Rob was depressed after Christine died and it was difficult for him, he continued living his life as much as he could. He still swims with the same group to this very day, despite the horrible memory of witnessing his wife's terrifying final affliction. One of La Jolla's most well-known tourist destinations is La Jolla Cove, a small cove surrounded by high rocky cliffs. It has become an excellent location for scuba diving, swimming, and snorkeling thanks to its wealth of marine life and colder crystal clear water. Additionally, the water visibility here can sometimes exceed 30 feet, enticing divers to gather from all corners of Southern California. Large and powerful swells from the open ocean can occasionally come in. At high tides, there is only a tiny patch of dry sand on the beach, but the cove's tide pools are exposed at shallow tides. But amidst the popularity and beauty of the cove lay a dark past. In June 1959, one of the most horrific shark attacks in San Diego, California occurred in Alligator Head, just a short ways off of La Jolla Cove. 
It was June 14, 1959. While most people were happy to sleep the day off, Robert Pamperin was awake early on a Sunday. Peeking through his windows, he noticed that the weather was slightly not in his favor. It was a bad day to be in the ocean. However, Robert and his friend Gerard had planned for this day for quite a while. They were planning on hunting for abalone later in the day. Abalones are huge marine gastropod mollusks. The chilly waters of New Zealand, Australia, South Africa, Japan, and the west coast of North America are where the huge sea snail is most frequently observed. Abalones are regarded for their exquisite meat and extraordinarily deep flavor, making them a culinary delicacy. It is one of the most expensive types of seafood available, and it can be sold at a high price, either canned, frozen, or live in the shell. Robert and Gerard were hoping to sell some of their catch for a reasonable price, knowing there was a thriving abalone population in the deeper parts of Alligator Head. However, abalones are typically nocturnal animals. They like staying away from lit areas by hiding in the dark during the daytime and feeding at night. This means Robert and Gerard had to go through with the hunting later in the day. To help fill the time in the afternoon, the two friends decided to take their girlfriends to the beach. The plan was while the girls were sunbathing at the shore, Robert and Gerard would leave to hunt at Alligator Head. Robert prepared for the day like any other. He made breakfast and listened to the news, not realizing that today's calm, cloudy day would take a nightmarish turn. Hunting abalone is actually quite taxing to the body, as it requires a lot of movement, so Robert would be free diving later on. He prepared minimal equipment, a pair of blue swim fins, a pink bathing suit, a black mask, black diving gloves, and a yellow handled abalone iron, a tool used to extract abalone from rocks without harming them. He also brought with him a black inner tube with an attached burlap sack. After Robert and his girlfriend finished preparing everything, they got into their car and made their way to the beach at La Jolla Cove. The sun was still overcast, but every now and again it would peek through the clouds. The outing could have been easily cancelled, but there was no stopping Robert and Gerard. Arriving at the beach, Robert parked his car and met with Gerard and his girlfriend. The two shook hands and shared laughs. They talked about the weather and, of course, the hunt later. Meanwhile, their girlfriends caught up with one another. The four headed straight for the beach and spent time like they normally would. They had a front row seat for the beautiful San Diego ocean after all. Who wouldn't want to enjoy a nice, relaxing Sunday like this? Around 5 p.m., Robert and Gerard gathered their equipment from their parked vehicles and headed towards Alligator Head. The weather was still overcast and the two men could only see through 7 meters of water underneath them. Not exactly an ideal day for hunting abalone. However, it was time to dive into the water. The two men donned their masks, fins, and gloves. They headed straight for the water. The men were experienced swimmers and divers, so they were trained well enough to understand the risks of entering the ocean. Being an engineer for Convair, an aircraft manufacturer, Robert was nobody's fool. However, what probably gave them confidence was the history of the area. There had been no fatal shark attacks in this area before. In the eyes of the public, it was a safe diving spot. However, that would all soon change. The two men took deep breaths and went into the depths. Swimming slowly across the water, they scanned the area for wild abalone hiding in the crevices and surfaces of rocks at the bottom. Spotting a couple of abalones a few meters down, the two men quickly dove deeper. With one hand holding the iron and the other holding the burlap sack, the two carefully scraped the shelled creatures from their attachments. They were careful not to damage the shells, but they had to do things quickly. After all, there was no air tank to save them from drowning. After gathering a few abalones, the men surfaced and took in a breath of fresh air. Fate must have had other plans that day, because for some reason, the two became separated by the waves. Slowly but surely, Robert and Gerard drifted apart until there were 10 to 15 meters between them. Suddenly, a great white shark appeared underneath Robert, swinging its formidable head back and forth. It was sizing up Robert, thinking it was one of its prey. And then it happened. The shark went in for the kill, and the water exploded into chaos. Opening its massive jaws, the creature was able to devour Robert's entire lower body, forcing him unnaturally higher out of the surface. Robert screamed desperately, Help me! Gerard quickly whipped in the direction of his friend. He saw Robert in distress, but thought he might be having a cramp. Nevertheless, Gerard rushed to his friend's aid. However, something was not right. Gerard noticed that Robert suddenly disappeared into the waters, leaving behind a crimson mist of blood.
Startled and in complete disbelief, Gerard plunged deeper into the water to really see what was happening to Robert. And there it was, in plain and perfect view, a large great white shark completely devouring Robert's lower body. Gerard estimated the creature to be around 7 meters in length. Robert thrashed wildly, trying to free himself from the marauding beast, however, it was to no avail. The shark's power overwhelmed him and it quickly took him to deep waters. Gerard took a deep breath and quickly rushed towards the commotion, waving his hands frantically at the shark in an attempt to scare it away. However, it was to no avail. The shark's jaws were clamped shut on Robert's lower body, his legs inside the creature's jaws. Suddenly, the massive shark began swinging its head from side to side, trying to tear Robert in half. Realizing he wasn't doing anything to the creature, Gerard swam back to the shore, alerting the lifeguards who then alerted the local authorities of the attack. Immediately after Robert's attack, 10 experienced scuba divers dove into the area, searching for Robert. However, after combing the waters for two hours, they ended up with nothing, not even Robert's clothing or gear. However, a few days later, a swim fin marked with rows of shark teeth washed ashore on the La Jolla beach. Upon inspection, authorities discovered the written initials of Robert. In the subsequent investigations, people were skeptical of Gerard. However, his statement was supported by William Abbott, who was atop a rock formation when the attack happened. His testimony was congruent with Gerard's. However, people were still skeptical that it was a great white shark that attacked Robert. They wanted to believe it was a killer whale, but Gerard was sure he saw a great white. Investigations revealed four crucial events happening beforehand that may have contributed to Robert's gruesome fate. Firstly, divers were spearing yellowtail less than two hours before the attack. Sharks are reported to be attracted to speared fish and the low frequency vibrations of the commotion. Secondly, hours before the attack, a US Navy sailor had badly lacerated himself in the adjacent rocks. Consequently, he lost a lot of blood while he was in the water, further attracting the shark into the area. Thirdly, approximately 600 meters to the west of the cove were a group of harbor seals perched by the rocks. The fourth reason is probably the most contributory to the attack. The night before the attack, a dead whale washed 800 meters ashore to the north of where Robert was attacked. This may have drawn unwanted attention from the shark, ultimately causing the gruesome fate of Robert. It was undoubtedly a tragedy what happened to Robert. We can all agree, whether you're an experienced diver or swimmer, things outside of your control can directly influence your time in the ocean. You should always keep in mind that when you enter the water, you're entering the beast's territory. You're at their mercy and growing up to 7 meters in length, it could easily swallow you whole. Even in the waters with no previous shark fatalities, without taking the proper precautions, you could easily end up as the first shark attack victim to meet their unfortunate final affliction. Although there are currently more than 1,000 different shark species, one extinct species has captured the world's attention since its discovery in 1835, the Megalodon. Thought to be nearly 20 meters long, it would have been three times the size of the modern great white shark and would have dominated the seas before it died out 2.6 million years ago. Despite the species never being seen outside of fossilized remains, the prehistoric shark has become somewhat of an urban legend in recent years, as people debate whether it evaded extinction and now lives out at sea somewhere. Most dispel this as a myth. But what happens when a shark is spotted that's as big as a minibus? Although not a megalodon, a creature of that size living in our oceans is a terrifying thought. You might think, surely something like that can't exist outside the realms of the imagination, but you would be wrong, as Lloyd Skinner discovered when he found himself face to face with a dinosaur-esque predator. 37-year-old Lloyd Skinner was visiting South Africa for a month after finishing a stretch within a mine in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. After a few hard months underground, rarely seeing the sun and putting his body through hell, he was excited for his holiday. He was planning to be in the country for a month before he headed to the United Kingdom for his next adventure, but he would never make it out of South Africa. On January 12, 2010, Lloyd decided he would spend the day in False Bay at Fishhook, which was home to a small but beautiful bay. 
Although the waves could be rough and there were a large number of sharks known to be in the area, he decided that today would be the day that he would go swimming. He loved to swim in the warm southern waters and prepared his trunks and goggles so he could make the most of his time in the water. Sadly, those goggles would turn out to be the cause of his savage death. As Lloyd and girlfriend Deborah arrived at the beach, they were disappointed by the weather as it had become colder and cloudier since the morning. Now it was about midday and they had just arrived, but Lloyd was still determined to go swimming, regardless of how the weather would turn out. Deborah decided she would stay on the shore and sunbathe, meaning that Lloyd could safely leave all of his things with her without having to worry. With his mind unburdened, he headed into the water and began to swim out to sea. There were quite a few other people in the water, and he briefly acknowledged them as he passed by, but ultimately wanted to swim alone. He continued to swim until he was about 100 meters from shore, but it was still pretty shallow. He stood in the ocean, with the water coming up to his chest, so he didn't consider himself to be particularly far out to sea. He could see the other swimmers in the distance, but was grateful for the space alone and quickly began to swim back and forth in what felt like his own private pool. After some time, Lloyd noticed his goggles were filling with some water, so he stopped to readjust them. Although the water was only to his chest, he couldn't see the seafloor. The waves were kicking up the sand so much that the water was dark and murky. He thought nothing of it, but little did he know that something was watching his legs from the depths. Lloyd put his goggles back on just in time as he was dragged under the waves. He had been tossed around for a few seconds under the water before he even realized what was happening. He had been attacked by a shark, and now his legs were bleeding profusely. Panicking, he began to shout for help and managed to get the attention of some people on shore as he waved and screamed that a shark had bitten him. There was a mixed reaction from those further into shore. Some began to swim out to his aid, while others swam away in a panic, hoping that if they reached the sand in time, then they wouldn't be the next victim of the massive fish. He felt a wave of relief as he saw his rescuers make their way towards him, but he had underestimated how far out to sea he was and how long it would take for help to arrive. As he tried to swim towards them, he was suddenly pulled underwater again. Lloyd felt sharp teeth sink deep into his abdomen as he screamed in agony. If there was any hope for him before, it was gone now. He turned to face his attacker through his goggles and was shocked at the sheer size of the animal before him. The animal's head dwarfed him, proving to him just how easily the shark could overpower him. The massive animal continued to bite down on his torso and shook him violently determined that Lloyd would be its next meal. His vision was beginning to cloud, both from blood loss and the fact that the ocean was now a deep red color as the shark continued to rip him apart. For just a second, the shark let go of his body and he floated to the surface, barely fighting to keep his head above water to take his last breath. He could hear faint screams from the shore as people spotted his mangled body in the distance and could only imagine the horror that his girlfriend was feeling as she helplessly watched him bleed to death so far out to sea. With one last desperate look to shore, Lloyd was pulled below the water for the last time, where the shark took him far out to sea and devoured the poor man. The witnesses on the beach couldn't believe what they had just seen. One minute, everything was calm and serene, and the next, blood was pouring into the ocean and they couldn't seem to figure out why. When they heard Lloyd screaming for help, they realized what had happened and panicked. From the safety of the shoreline, they watched in horror as the shark came back again and again, ripping into the man as he struggled to escape before it finally ripped him apart and dragged him out to sea. They were terrified by the size. It was at least 14 feet long, about the size of a minibus, which made Lloyd look like a doll in comparison as he was thrown around by the huge animal. It was a horrifying thing to see, but even as the rescuers got to the scene, they couldn't see any sign of him except for the massive amount of blood that had stained the ocean. They called for the emergency services, who began to search the ocean with four rescue boats and a helicopter but they knew that there was no hope of finding Lloyd alive, judging from the descriptions that the witnesses had given. 
they were hopeful that they would be able to at least recover some body parts so that the family would have something to bury, but they couldn't find anything. The shark had devoured the man whole and left nothing behind. The locals began to worry as these shark attacks were becoming more and more common. A shark expert was consulted and they determined that it was most likely a great white shark that had killed Lloyd Skinner due to its massive size and unique hunting style. A large shark had been spotted in the area just a few hours before the attack, but the shark flag was not raised to alert the people on the beach. Everyone on the beach that day continued to swim without any worry at all about sharks. If they had raised the flag when they first saw the shark, maybe this even could have been avoided. But unfortunately, it cost a man his life. There have been lots of discussions since then to figure out how to avoid these attacks, but most have been deemed too impractical or expensive to yield any worthwhile results. Some of these ideas included sonar buoys that could alert the lifeguards to the presence of a shark, or even some talk of an electrified system to send a shock to any approaching sharks before they had the opportunity to get too close. Until a method that will prevent all sharks from entering the waters around the beaches, these brutal attacks will continue. The great white sharks around the coast of South Africa will always be lurking, waiting for its next meal, bringing another innocent person to their terrifying final affliction.